Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to Unsung Hero. Our mission of the highlights special talents in our society. There are lots of people that are working in the society. They don't want people to know. But we like, we're looking for them and trying to get them into the highlights. Today, we have um, Shota Chaudhry from Kunbyan University. At uh, end of the show, I'm sure you will say if he's a hero or not. Uh, Shota Chaudhry from Kunbyan University. Would you like to introduce yourself to our viewers? Cool. Asalaamu As Alaikum. My name is Shota Chaudhry. I'm a lifelong East Ender um, and I work as a community organizer in Tower Hamlets. Fantastic. Tell us about your education. How did you progress in your education? Oh, I don't think I was that good in education when it started off. I had parents who were quite well educated and wanted me to do well. I think I struggled when I was in primary school, but then uh, I did okay. I went to local schools and then I went to a local secondary, a comprehensive secondary school. Uh, then I uh, did some A-levels. I don't think I made the best decisions of the A-levels I picked. But, um, but eventually I found myself in university. I went to had a modest degree in social sciences. Um, and then when I was thinking about what it is I wanted to do in the world, I did a, a, a master's in community organising in Queen Mary University. And that really set me up for all the things that I've been doing for the last five years. Well, what else do you do, apart from your teaching? Do you, I've, I've been researching on your, uh, you do um, Citizen UK and you've been interviewing Prime Ministers or the events you organise. Would you like to tell us, our viewers, regarding how do you do you achieve that? So if you're talking about like, so Citizens UK is a like, a, imagine it as a community organisation of lots of organisations. There's about 370 churches, mosques, schools, universities, trade unions, community groups that are all, uh, we, get, we encourage them all to work together across the country um, and to, to try and achieve social, social justice. And we work locally, nationally um, and regionally as well. And one of the things that happened in 2010 and 2015, we had a prime ministerial assembly, which we had the leaders, we tried to get the leaders of the three main parties, the Conservatives, Labour and uh, Lib Dems. So in 2010, I think you went to the event, That's, right? I have actually. You that went was... to that one. So it was pretty incredible. Two and a half thousand people in Central Methodist Hall near Westminster. And in front of them was Gordon Brown, who was then, of course, president and um, prime minister of the country. There was um, the leader of the opposition in the Conservatives, David Cameron, was there. That was before he became prime minister. And there was Nick Clegg before he became um, deputy. And we basically presented to them a whole host of um, issues that were facing the communities that we represented. So what are the thoughts behind organizing one of the biggest events of the year? Behind the thoughts the are to be really ambitious and to want to really engage with people in power in order to make change because you know if you think about some of the most powerful people in the country is whoever's the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister within uh, government and actually saying just before the elections saying we need to engage with these people in order to make sure for, for the next five years they're really delivering on what communities are um, um, suffering from or would like to see um, to realize their ambitions. It's really important that you have them there. So we want to uh, strike relationships with power. Tell me about the campaigns you guys do because Citizen UK is one of the biggest um, campaign organizing team in the country. Yeah. Yes. Like you said before, you have mosque, you have church, you have uh, universities, college, everything, everyone's involved in it. The benefits, the especially for the Muslims, for the Muslims especially. How does it work out? For okay, so community organizing is like one model of change. There's lots of models of change, but um, and it's quite well known because Barack Obama used to be a community organizer, so it's got really well known now, but it's been around for thousands of years, people coming together around issues. Um, the benefits of people being part of Citizens UK is you get to develop the capacity of your organization that you're working with. It's about leaders, um, it's about leadership development. So not necessarily we only look to the politician, but it's about ordinary people like me and you saying actually there's an issue that really bothers us. We know lots of people um, that are also similarly affected, like let's get together. And then community organizers in Citizens UK spend time teaching people how to develop a pragmatic form of leadership where you learn to win things. Fantastic. Um, and so some of the campaigns that we've worked on, I mean, the campaigns come out of everywhere really, but some of the campaigns we've worked on are things like the living wage, which has become national and it's now like uh, used by every single politician and business uh, that you find. And originally it was a campaign around people who are struggling, who are working really hard, sometimes two, three jobs, um, just to 
cover how much it costs to live and the minimum wage wasn't enough and these people were trying to raise families um, so you know there would be some people taking a two hour bus journey to get to work or from home but they could have took the train for 45 minutes but it's because it costs too much so around the east end uh, this campaign started beginning and it went all around the country and won hundreds of millions of pounds originally people said it was impossible to get something called the living wage going which is a higher than the minimum wage which represents the cost of living um, but now there's over 2,000 companies, alhamdulillah, which you know affects our people as well. Because how do you manage? It's a really big organization. Yeah. Well, how do you manage to come together and decide I want to do this? What are the tips do you use? Because so democracy is messy. Yeah, democracy is really messy. But we try to be democratic, so we do listening. So it's like a research phase. So we go and talk to people face to face through surveys and other things. But we like to do things relationally as an organization. We think that's the most important thing. People need to know one another, trust one another, to really get to know each other and think about what really matters and how we can have a creative solution. Um, so, so, um, so we will talk to each other and talk to as many people as possible, involve as many people as possible, find out their stories. We think stories are one of the most powerful things. You can create lots of statistics around things, right? This fact, this fact. But if you tell a story about somebody, it's the most powerful thing you can do. So we collect lots of stories around an issue. And during this research phase, we try and work out specifically what the issue is. Yeah. So we won't just say something like, it's poverty. We have to be specific. Yeah, and so something like the living wage. And then we have to build enough power to be able to do it. There's something I'm really interested to know. Go on. You know, the normal meeting the Prime Ministers, mm -hmm. they go to, they usually, they have the say. But in your campaign, in your meeting, it's totally different. Yeah. They come to say yes, actually. They've they got no choice to say no. How do you put them into that? Tra it's not a trap, actually. You actually <laughs> squeeze them in a the corner. Yeah, yeah. So they have no say, and they can't say no. Yeah. How do you do that? Well, if you and give a politician you an hour, they'll take an hour talking, right? So what we do, we say this is our meeting and you're invited to our meeting. We want to work with you, but you have four minutes to respond. Yeah. So what we want to do is business. It's like we want to show that the communities around the UK can do business. So we're not going to just sit there and do lots of clapping, just be really polite and nice or do lots of shouting. We want to do business with them. We want to say, right, we respect that you're the prime minister or you're the mayor of London. But like, here's a series of things that we are concerned about. We know that you have the power, your power to do it, or you have the people uh, that you know in your, within your relationships and networks that you can uh, make something happen. We want you to do it. Um, and we say, will you do it, yes or no? Or like a little bit of detail. But we usually do lots of the work behind the scenes as well. But like, we want them to publicly admit, um, uh, um, commit to things. Okay, you mentioned um, the inspiration you get from, from your mother. Yeah, yeah, I did. You know, you met so many people. I'm sure you've been lots of lots of people around the world. You've been to you said, 40 different countries. Yeah, I think I'm, so. I've not I'm going to ask you your age. Something like that. I wouldn't ask your age. Yeah. I'm assuming 40 different countries. Why did you choose your mother as the inspiration? Could it be somebody else? Okay, so if I was to connect it to me traveling and my mother, my mom had guts. Like, uh, some, when I was little, I used to go to a school where, like, most of the kids were, like, you know, from, like, I'm um, sure your mother's watching you. You're going to say something. I, I love hope you, not. Or I like hope that. not. I no. hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. What She's do you find difficult when you say I love you, mother? Uh, what do you find difficult? You know what? My mom's not the really huggy type okay. either. <laughs> so it's fine. It works for both of us. All right. But um, I said my mom because honestly, like when we were growing up, you know, lots of families, they grow up with extended cousins and families and things like that together. Um, I didn't get that opportunity. We grew up by us, sort of by ourselves in London. Um, and my mum raised us, like my dad was a bit poorly while I was growing up so my mum took care of him, took care of us um, and she just never gave up, she would just keep going at things um, and I remember she used to be one of the only women in the 80s around where, um, who used to have professional jobs and when I was a child I used to get bullied because people used to be like, oh your mum works I actually got bullied when I was six years old by a boy who basically said Oh, your mum drives a car and found that really funny, you know, but I thought it was quite cool, the fact that... Are you talking about 1960s? No! <laughs> okay, in the, okay. I'm telling you, in the 90s, in the 90s, early... Late, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like early, early 90s. And actually, these things never stopped my mum. She was still able to be uh, my mum, provide all the things uh, for us, but like, also, like, she never put us into any sort of stereotypical traps, or you must be this, you must be that. She sort of went, yeah, you're interested in this, Go learn about it, go do your thing, um, so, which was, you know, incredible. No, no, it's like, amazing. Yeah. Reminded you that God and family was really important, 
but like what you did, as long as it was halal, like it was up to you. Um, so that, you know, that yeah, was that's amazing. I want to say something to our parents if they're watching. Rabbi and sisters, uh, I'd say a few words in Bengali because it's a really interesting word here is I think you should bring them into the living room and get them to learn something from this young man. Tini Bolchen can share to many 40 countries of the world he's around, but he chose his mother as the main focal point, inspirational. That is this is something useful. If I if you ask my son, he will say something else. Honestly, he won't do that. <laughs> but the effort your mother putting behind you, now you are alhamdulillah you're flourishing. Mm -hmm. This is how it is. You pull your effort and it works. That's why I say your mother is also one of the heroes we're looking for. I hope one day I'll give her an interview. Uh, inshallah. Okay, tell me, I know you've been doing one of the biggest events of the country, especially the way you've done it, actually. You are pushing Prime Minister to say yes, and he did say yes. Also the mayor, I've been to one of them. Tell me, the fail, did he ever fail? Like, I'm sure there's are struggle going to that level. If you failed, how did you overcome? That would be very interesting for our viewers. Yeah, I think, I think yes is the answer yeah, in terms of fail. Um, I think before you were asking me was one of the saddest moments of my life. And believe it or not, it was actually at work once when um, I was working with a group of people. And there was a campaign they were really interested in. And I was quite young then. I was about 21. And I was too keen and not as strategic as I needed to be about things. And I misinterpreted how a certain party would interact with us. I thought they would help. And actually, they were there for themselves. And it was one of those life um, useful lessons in life. But I wish I didn't learn it. But it was really good I learned it. And you fail. And you fail a group of people. And it's uh, quite upsetting. And it's demoralizing for them as well. The way you pick up is you carry on and you say, look, other things can win. Like the world has changed many, 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 many times. Uh, you know, like, you know, we, we, we are like uh, at a time where, you know, only 50, 60 years ago, civil liberties wasn't really understood across the world. And then you see the things like Martin Luther King and um, what that movement of the civil rights movement was able to achieve. But it's almost impossible to, to believe that life was, you know, so bad for people of color. Not that I'm saying, it's that much, um, you know, everything's perfect now. But um, you, you have to keep going, and that's the main thing. I think social change, like changing society, is like a snowball. You have to show people a certain win, even if it's small, and then lots of people start going, oh, okay, there's something here, and then they carry on, and you get bigger, and you get bigger. And so your ambition gets bigger and bigger as a result. Brilliant. Can I ask you something else? Yeah. Quite different than the usual ones. In our society, you know, there are lots of young people, mashallah, they're going to universities, yeah. Oxford, Cambridge. We've got, um, we got, not Prime Minister, hopefully, in the future. There should be one. Inshallah. But um, how do you see in five years' time, as you're progressing, how do you see this Muslim community, a small community in this country, UK, in five years' time, where do you see them? Have a rough guess. I'm, okay. I'm sure you... Uh, I think there's a... Uh, th there's two ways of answering this. I think if we just look at the Muslim community and see like um, the issues that are being faced, um, we have to deal with a particular set of issues that lots of other ethnic, um, ethnic minorities or religious minorities don't have to face. They can sort of get on with their own way in life, but we're being sort of, uh, let's say, attacked or persecuted by the media, um, by various sections of the government, politi um, politicians within politics and so forth. Even employment, like lots of our people like the last to be hired, first to be fired sort of thing, especially during tough times. So we're facing lots of these challenges, but at the same time, you know when people are in really tough situations, they become the most creative. That's when people like community spirit really comes out, like people get together and go, actually, this is a big issue and we should go forth. If I'm really honest with you, my job gets allows me to go into lots of spheres, like political, ec economic, like businesses, politicians, um, government associations, all sorts of things. And I, I'll tell you something. Lots of the people we grew up with who are Muslim have so much talent. And sometimes they think, oh, will I really get a really good job there somewhere? But actually, they're really resourceful. Like, even if we look at our community, the Bangladeshi community, uh, like they're really resourceful. They're very relational. They, they keep things together. They, they try out things. They're really entrepreneurial. The rest of society needs that. We just need to get into it. Like when I meet lots of other organizations where they're just like, oh, how, you know, we need these skills. I'm like, oh, I know loads of communities that are full of these skills. Um, for example, like Tech City, you know, the businesses around Old Street, 
it's one of the fastest growing parts of the economy in the country and one of the things they struggle to do is employ um, talented um, people and actually lots of the talent that they require is found locally within our streets wow. with the uh, kids that we work with we come to come into contact with and actually they need to be there to fill the talent earn the money and then do really well as well but sometimes they just don't know that they exist and our people sometimes don't know that they've got it in them as well but they definitely do okay can i ask you something um if your organization you consider it as the biggest organization in the country islamophobia is a really high Mm -hmm. This is something really, really nasty for everybody else. You know, no one likes uh, racist uh, and all like this kind of stuff. Is there any campaign? Is there anything you're doing about it? Yeah, I mean, what kind of stuff do you do? One of the things difficult about Islamophobia is uh, there is no arc Islamophobe. So there's not one person that's responsible for Islamophobia, right? And so it's really spread out, it's complicated. So Citizens UK, because we're a diverse alliance of lots of civil society organisations, what we've done is we've set up a commission into Islam. So we're going to go up and down the country to the various alliances we have in London, in Birmingham, in Nottingham, in Milton Keynes, in Cardiff, um, Newcastle. I think I've hopefully named most of them. Um, and we're going to visit the different Muslim communities there and other communities that work with the Muslims. And we're going to take this commission that is chaired by a guy called Dominic Greaves, who used to be the former attorney um, general for the government. So he's a he used to be a minister, in, he's a conservative. And it's also got people like the former head of the MI6, former head of land forces in uh, Afghanistan, it's got the former, um, it's got uh, like currently the electoral commission. So it's a very diverse um, set of people and it's not mainly Muslim. So it's a very objective but powerful, especially within policy terms. They're very powerful. And they're going to visit the different alliances and look at this. What are the contributions the Muslims make? Because we actually do lots of good things. You know? But we also do bad things. To be fair, yeah, and, and if we don't acknowledge our, our wrongs, I completely agree. we never learn. I completely you can't agree. just brush everything out of this Islamophobia. It's maybe not. Yeah. This is the, how we see it. But to be fair with everybody else, yeah, there are some, and there are some we probably overdoing it. How do you see it? Yeah, so I completely agree with you. There's lots that we need to learn. So if we look at something, an issue that's quite current, it's like lots of Muslim schools closing down. Um, some of it, we can argue, potentially, is because um, there might be a, an agenda or a certain way of looking at Muslim schools, therefore that they're being attacked. They've got an issue with madrasas, but then they're protecting, say, Sunday schools. So th th there's this sort of thing going on and you're going, oh, hold on, is there double standards? What's really going on here? And actually some of our schools, because they're not part of like um, the way the state system works, they might not follow or be aware of all the rules and regulations and have the same access to training and resources or funding in order to make things happen. So we want this. We want to be like, OK, let's see who we can get um, support from for the grievances we have, like the issues we have in certain parts of the media and government and whatever, and the relationship between Muslims and the government. But also, let's look at ourselves and see the things that we can improve and see how everybody else can help us. So that's the way. Um, and this commission, hopefully within the next two years, will come up with a compact so we can um, say, oh, here's the commissioners, here's civil society, the state and government. Let's see what solutions we can make together and really act on them. I'm sure there's some goodness behind because of the, the really hard policies that come in. People are changing. They, they get into a standard high. They are thinking about broadening their um, education. They're thinking about doing the uh, building works. There's some good news behind it, but yes, if he's done the right play, they're welcome to do that. And I think we should, we should see also positiveness as well into that. Because you could see in the corner, every corner we have this and that and that. Are they really safe? You know, there, there are lots of things that are happening. So we, I think in two, we see two ways. One is government doing, trying to do, a, maybe they have the agenda behind, we don't know. But they are trying to do better for everybody else. What do you think? I think it's about accountability. You, um, okay. you can't just hope that you're going to elect a politician and they're going to do the right thing. Uh, you have to always be on it. You have to always make sure that people are doing the right thing. Uh, sometimes good people make really bad decisions. So we need to make sure that we help them make the right decisions. And sometimes there's bad people making really terrible decisions which we need to stop. So I think that's probably the better way of seeing it. In your Facebook, also, you said you're cheeky. Anyway, I think not my Facebook, you're cheeky. my Twitter. Why I'm do, not on. Uh, why, do you, why do you say you're cheeky? So, as a child, I was the ones that, um, if you said no, 
I would love to hear it because I'd want to go off and do it anyway. If you said I couldn't do something, I'd try and go and prove that I could. And I don't think I've grown up since then. That that mentality probably uh, still uh, stays. But I think. I don't know, I could, and you I said you're always hungry. What, what do you mean? I'm hungry. Uh, yeah, this is a. Uh, it's becoming an issue now. You're not married. Is she, I don't think she would like that. You're always angry to eat something. Or you yeah. Don't. Wherever I travel, I always think through, oh, where, where, where am I going to eat first? Like, so I plan my whole day around the points where I'm going to eat whenever I'm traveling or going around doing different things. Uh, it's one of the most enjoyable things for me for, to go around and uh, try different foods. Give me so three names. Hungry. You've been to 40 different countries. Give me, give me three best names. You really enjoyed it. Okay. Three names out of Three the countries. I, really, I, I recently went to Lebanon. I went to Beirut. That was incredible because it was nothing like what I expected. Uh, another country that I really loved was Egypt. So I had a fascination with Egyptology and ancient history since I was really little. Um, so I went when I was 19 and it was incredible. I got to see the pyramid, the, the Giza pyramids, the, the pyramids of Giza, the value of the uh, kings, the tombs like, you know, Tutankhamun and stuff like that. that wow. you see. So that was incredible. Um, and one of the other uh, places that I went, you know, I love Bangladesh, you know, like, wow. I, I, I've been to Bangladesh the most probably. After France, I've been to Bangladesh like eight, nine times. And like Bangladesh is, uh, I go there and it's home straight away. I'm going to test you. Who's the Prime Minister of Bangladesh now? Uh, Hasina. Wow. Yeah, you, you can That's test good. me on all no, no, that. No, 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 because you said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not for her I go. Okay, okay, okay no, no, I'm just saying, I'm just, I'm just putting you on a test to see yeah, if you... Yeah, I go, you know, all, all my dad's family is there and it's just beautiful. Like, we go there and on the first day that they, they hear we're here, they'll walk a couple miles out of the village to come to the bazaar to come just sit on a bed with us and just, just chat for the whole night. And these are my dad's cousins, they're in their 50s, 60s, and they will come just to chat the whole night through. And it's just... It's amazing. You wake up in the early morning, you make the most of your day, you eat great food. I'm a big fan of um, our food, so you know, it's, um, it's, really, it's really nice. And we live near the um, tea plantation. Well, one thing, you know, I, I noticed my kids, my kid is 19, 17 and, and 13. If you ask them, let's go to Bangladesh, they will say, no, 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 I'm not going. But that's the culture, it came like that. A lot of people don't go. I haven't been to Bangladesh for 20 years. So it's your fault. He's, yeah, I take my fault, yeah. <laughs> I have my own reasons. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not comfortable there because um, I all, never feel settled. Mm, 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 mm. But yes, I'm going to take my kids. What would you advise for the young people, especially you as a teacher, what would you say to them? Okay, so it's really interesting. It's, if you see Bangladesh as a Brit, then you'll always be... Because it's weird. Bangladesh is growing up in Britain. They don't think of Bangladesh as an interesting place to visit or a holiday destination. They think of it as we have to go because of family. Whereas other people that visit it go, oh, okay, there's all these beautiful things to see there. There's all this history. There's all of this. And actually, just by traveling around, I realize that Bangladesh has so much to offer. The other thing that happens is, like, Bangladesh, yes, sometimes you're forced to go because your parents are telling you to go. It's not like, oh, I'm going to go Dubai or I'm going to go Maldives or whatever it is. And they often end up going and staying in the Bali or the Basha or whatever, and then they feel confined. And actually, it's a place where you can really explore. Um, and I don't think lots of them see that. And also, it's really important when you go young, not to let people settle thinking, oh, it was hot, sweaty, and, and mosquitoes. That's not the way to see it. Um, it's to visit a few times and really get an appreciation for what the country uh, and the society there is like. Fantastic. You know, I couldn't explain like that, honestly. If, if I talk, people would say, you've been gone for 20 years, you've given me a lecture to go to Bangladesh. Ah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Fantastic. Would you like to say anything to our viewers? What I would plead to our viewers is, like, the work that I do it means that I always meet amazing um, people, like, endlessly amazing people. But I would say that uh, Muslims who are contributing in mixed societies is still something that people look for more of. Uh, especially the um, non-Muslims, they're really looking for more, more Muslims to become part of uh, everyday things. Um, I think we're really good at doing things um, with ourselves, but so that's not usually enough and that's why we're finding lots of these challenges. So contribute whichever way it is, if you're going to write, if you're going to sp uh, do public speaking, if you're going to uh, if you're going to teach kids, if you you know volunteer, do it in places where it's quite unusual. Do it like this man does here. Always um, meets people that are not Muslim and doesn't necessarily talk about faith, but talks about normal things. So we don't always get uh, put into one little jar and here's the Muslims, put them all in here. 
Um, we're actually like, you know, there's many, many communities of, um, that um, Muslims belong to. And we need to be part of everyday life. That, that, that's nothing, that's actually something uh, within our faith that we're encouraged to do. So that's what I would encourage everyone to do. Brothers and sisters, um, thanks for being with us. End of the uh, interview, I really, really uh, excited, honestly. And I think, for me, I don't know what, they will make their own judgment. But I think you are one of the most successful person. I have interviewed so far, if you're the first one. Because I'm probably the first one, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> now, honestly, we can learn so much from this brother. And if you are the person we're looking for, please do get in contact with Ikra TV. And also, if you're friends, your family. Look, if a person like that is so successful, uh, we have thousands of people. Honestly, we have thousands of people around the country. We need to bring them out. And we need to give them the lights. And if we could do that together, I think we'll bring a success in this community and the society, and we'll live in the harmony, definitely. Yes, if I said anything wrong, please do forgive me, and see you next week. Jazakumullahu khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.